Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. As many of you doubtless know, in the 1990s, especially near the end of the decade, the very last years of the 20th century, cosmologists began to put together a picture of the inventory of what our universe is made of. It's a weird answer that science is giving us, whereby only 5% of the stuff in the universe by energy is ordinary matter, by which we mean all of the atoms, all the particles we've ever detected in particle accelerators or any other experiment, that kind of stuff, which includes all the galaxies that you see, all the light that you see from stars and planets and so forth, it all adds up to only 5% of the stuff in the universe. Another 25% is something called dark matter, which we think is some kind of particle that we just don't see. And the other 70% is something called dark energy, which might be the energy of empty space itself. Now, I know to a lot of people who are not professional astronomers or cosmologists, this dark stuff, this 95% of the universe, seems like some kind of fudge factor, just a, a recognition that astronomers don't understand what the universe is doing. But in fact, these are testable hypotheses, and over the last couple decades, astronomers have been increasing the precision with which we can test and talk about dark matter in particular to enormous accuracy. So in fact, the life of a real astronomer is not spent thinking about is there dark matter or isn't there, but we can actually map out where the dark matter seems to be, how it's acting, how it's interacting with other kinds of particles, both dark matter and ordinary matter, how dark matter can influence the formation of stars and galaxies and even more. So today's podcast guest is Lena Nasib. She is currently, I think currently, uh, a postdoc here at, at Caltech, my home institution. Uh, in the fall, she's going to start a job at MIT as a new faculty member there. And Lena specializes in the physics and astrophysics of dark matter, how it's detected and how we map out where it is in our galaxy. Knowing where the dark matter is, knowing how much of it there is in different parts of space is crucial if we do eventually want to detect it. And of course, that's the goal, that we build a laboratory experiment here where we can see the dark matter directly. If we're able to do that, we'll know what it is. But to be able to do that, we need to know how much of it to expect in our experiments. So it's fascinating both from the particle physics point of view, wondering what the dark matter might be, and also from the astrophysics point of view, thinking about the dynamics of stars and gas and dust and how they interact with the dynamics of dark matter. So remember, you can support the Mindscape podcast on Patreon. There's a Patreon page. You can find a link on the Mindscape webpage. And I'd also like to give the occasional shout out to people who have found other creative ways to support Mindscape. Um, There's a PayPal link. And I don't like the PayPal as much, not because it bothers me, but because I don't have any way to give back. Uh, If you're a Patreon supporter, you get ad-free versions of the podcast, and you also get to ask questions at a monthly AMA. If you give on PayPal, you get nothing. But my eternal gratitude. So thank you very much for that. I also want to mention in particular Adrian Leatherland, who made a one-time special donation to help defray the costs of the hosting costs for Mindscape, the actual service that keeps the audio files and sends them to you so you can listen to them. Let's just say it's not cheap. So I'm extremely grateful to Adrian for helping out with that cost. I'm extremely grateful to anyone who listens to the podcast, supports it in, in any way. It's very nice when people send a couple bucks my way, but I just like the fact that so many people are listening to it, especially when we're in the middle of kind of a global mess and uh, we have to stick together in different ways. So I think that this episode is one you're really going to enjoy. Let's go. Lena Nassib, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So we're here to talk about dark matter, and we'll get into some of the weeds, I think, but let's first assuage some of the doubts out there. Uh, Probably most (laughs) listeners to the podcast will be willing to accept the existence of dark matter, even if we don't know what it is, but I know that there are some skeptics. Uh, As someone who really devotes their career to studying dark matter, what what is the answer you give when someone says, what is that and why do you think it's there? Um, I would say that it's a very good question. It's one of the most important physics questions, actually, currently, and, you know, for the past, actually, about 100 years now. Um, so what is, let's start with what is dark matter. So basically, from 
in the early 1900s, and especially in the 1930s, there have been a lot of studies in trying to understand how much mass there is out there uh, based on, you know, for example, the dynamics of stars, like the motion of galaxies, the motion of stars, you try to figure out what is their mass. And then if you kind of do the math, you it, if you calculate, you're estimating the mass based on the stars or the amount of light that you see versus based on the kinematics or, you know, the motion of stars and how fast they're going, mm -hmm. you realize that there is a, quite a bit of a discrepancy there. And basically the theory of dark matter is kind of to try to figure out what else is missing or how do we fix this? So I think the simplest way to think about it is that basically the stars in our galaxy and our galaxy, you know, is a disk spiral galaxy that you can see in a lot of the pictures. But basically, the stars are rotating uh, faster than you would expect. So you would expect that their rotational velocity is going to drop as a function of their distance away from the center of the galaxy. This is basically another way to say the stars at the edges, you expect them to rotate a lot slower than the stars in the center. Mm -hmm. If all the mass that was there is just based on you know, the stars that you see. But what has been done in a lot of work, and in particular in the work of Vera Rubin in the 1970s, is that stars on the edges are rotating pretty much at the same speed as stars closer to the center, which is very bizarre. It means that either you had kind of you have about two ways to go. You either have to change the laws of gravity, or you have to add that there is something there that has mass and is contributing to the gravity of your system and of your galaxy, but you just can't see it. And these are like the two major trains of thought here. Okay, so what what is to stop me from saying that it's just uh, something we don't understand about gravity? After all, gravity is very weak, and we're talking about the size of a galaxy. We've never been there. We've never uh, visited distances that far away. That's right. And um, so there, it's not just, I don't, if you only have the dynamics, Right, you can actually build, and some people did build, you know, uh, a decent theory of gravity that would explain these kind of these kind of distributions and these changes. However, there are a lot of other things that we need to take into account. So your theory has to explain slash predict multiple observ observations or observables. Um, for example, one of them is basically the power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, which is a lot of words. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> this a lot is of words. <laughs> it is a lot of words. But uh, basically what happened is that, so if we kind of go back into a brief history of time, uh, the universe started very, very hot. And then as the universe expanded, it was cooling. So we were forming more and more bound states. And as we were doing that, at some point, all the a lot of the electrons or all the electrons actually bound in with protons to become hydrogen. And then the universe was kind of like all of a sudden neutral, which means that light can go through without hitting anything. You, If the electrons and the protons are all over the place, then whatever, uh, if you have light, it will kind of get absorbed and, and um, it will get absorbed by all of these particles. Anyways, so basically at about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, after the beginning of the universe, uh, there was light. And interestingly enough, it is light that we can actually detect now. Um, interestingly, its imprints or like its properties and, you know, the fluctuations in that what we call the cosmic uh, microwave background or CMB really tells us about the initial structures. And this is one, one of the most precise measurements that we have in modern astronomy astrophysics actually these are these famous pictures we see right of like the ellipse with the green and red colors etc of the background that's right yes so um so the interesting thing that we can get out of the cmb is basically how the origin of matter and galaxies uh, and basically like the original size of the galaxy so the so one thing that you know a theory of dark matter does explain quite well is how much amount like what is the amount of dark matter that we can see there that was initially that is not out of the you know the matter budget of the things that we're made of mm -hmm. so said a different said differently uh we know because of this very precise measurement we know that um 84 percent of the matter budget of the universe is made is part of this dark matter that we just 
that is different from you know the standard model, different from electrons, different from protons, different from what makes the stars and our iPhones and all of the stuff that we already know. So it has to be something there. Uh, that kind of measurement is a little bit difficult to make up just with a theory and with a new theory of gravity, and that's why. Well, that's why I work on dark matter <laughs> and <laughs> others might disagree. But yeah, so what I'm trying to say is that there are a lot of other observables, the CMB is just one of them, that kind of push for more of this theory that there is something else that is there. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think that a lot of people who are dark matter skeptics are a little bit stuck in the 1980s thinking that uh, all they have to do is to explain the rotation curves of spiral galaxies and uh, they can declare victory over dark matter. But these days, there's a lot more data from a lot of completely different sources that points in exactly the same direction. Uh, absolutely, exactly. So I think there are there are a lot of these wonderful reviews that kind of, and I, I've been to a talk uh, that actually kind of numbered them, and there were I think fourteen different observables that the speaker was mentioning, all from these different mechanisms at different scales. You know, from galaxy clusters to smaller galaxies um, to just the Milky Way, etc. That you know, that kind of all point into a direction that there is there is a new particle, there is something there. Maybe it doesn't it doesn't have to be like a particle particle, but there is some new species of matter that we call dark matter now that can explain all of this. Well, so that's the, that's the other thing, right? Yeah, the, uh, the, the point here is it's not just some stars that are dark or, you know, some planets or something like that. We have reason to believe that it's a different kind of thing. Is that right? That's right. So we... Th so whatever it is, it has very uh, small probability to interact with the standard model. It's kind of made out of a different thing. Um, there has been a lot of these theories about, yes, being exactly that, like being dim stars. Um, and uh, these ended up being called machos, which stands for massive. Massive compact halo objects. Thank you. <laughs> machos. So there are a lot of these experiments that actually ruled out different scales of machos. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of tells us that it's really, it's not just some object that is just a star that is just way too dim and we can't see it that contributes to the mass. Yeah, it's something else. But it could be black holes, right? Yes. So it could be primordial black holes. Uh, there has been a lot of work, especially recently, um, on trying to understand what is the possibility, or, like what is the parameter space. So it, it, is the theory of primordial black holes explaining dark matter still possible? There is some disagreement within the community of how much of it is ruled out. It's not, the theory is not completely ruled out, but quite a few chunks of it are. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, it, yeah, it depends on, on the measurements. And there are some, like, very small windows, for example. I think 15 to 30 solar masses is still possible, something like that. Um, so, yeah, so it is not a completely ruled out theory. It also could be, or it is uh, even more possible, that uh, primordial black holes would make up a fraction of what we call dark matter and then the rest is something else. So... I mean, the way that we think about dark matter, of course, you have to think about the simplest thing first. You think it's the one thing, but honestly, it could be a composite set of things, right? For in the 80s, we thought it was neutrinos. Hmm. And neutrinos, uh, I, I know a physicist who just, who says like, come on people, we have to say that neutrinos are a part of the dark matter because <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> they, they exist are dark, and they're dark. Exactly. It's just that they're a very small fraction. They cannot explain all the dark matter that we have. So, well, yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, we're sort of we're working our way backwards from the weirdest theories to the most popular ones. Uh, so modifying gravity by itself doesn't work. I mean, gravity might be different, right, on cosmic scales, but it's not enough yep. to explain all of the data that the dark matter does. Black holes, you're saying you're, you seem to be saying, if I can summarize it, that uh, if there is some mechanism for making black holes early on, they could be some of the dark matter, but it's hard to make them be all of it. Is that fair? That's right. Yes. Um, it's much more difficult to make them pure, like to make them all completely the dark matter. It could be a small fraction that has not been ruled out. Yes. And what kind of experiments? I mean, how would you know? How do you how do you test that? 
So uh, a lot of these experiments for looking for primordial black holes are um, basically based, uh, look, using gravitational lensing on different scales. So, uh, so gravitational lensing is basically that if you have something very, very massive between you and you know, an object that actually emits a lot of light, then the light is going to get bent in one in different ways. So you what you would see in the sky are like these beautiful rings or Einstein rings mm. um, that tell you that there is a mass. So there are different like a variety of um, uh, gravitational lensing of, on different scales, like weak lensing, micro lensing, etc. So these uh, or at least part of them, uh, part of these methods are used to try to determine how uh, if there are a lot of these primordial black holes or these black holes around. So for example, you you know how much dark matter there should be. And so for each mass range of you know black holes, you would estimate how the number that you would see and then you would kind of scan the sky and try to, see, to study the motion of stars and try to see if there if there is this lensing because based statistically based on the number that you would expect, you would, you would have to see some of these kind of uh, some of these rings and some of these evidence for weak lensing, etc. So when you don't see that, you can put a bound on a specific mass and a specific fraction uh, of these black holes. So if the dark matter, in other words, were little tiny subatomic particles, they'd be kind of distributed smoothly and they wouldn't cause a lot of these lensing events. But if you lump a bunch of dark matter into a black hole, it can sort of have a bigger impact now and again and you would notice it. That's exactly right. So if your so if your dark matter is made out of particles, you have to kind of adjust and have different ways of detecting it versus if it was black holes, then you can you know, use these methods of weak lensing. So um, for particles, for example, there are three major kind of uh, methods or detection experiments that uh, that has been that we've been looking into: um, colliders, direct detection, and indirect detection. And okay. um, I'm happy to kind of go through. Please <laughs> what do. These yeah. Are. So, 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 but sorry. Let's just catch our breath. So the the. The point is that most working astrophysicists or cosmologists think that not only is there dark matter, but it's something that's not in the standard model of particle physics, something you've never found here on Earth, and it's some kind of particle. It's probably not all just black holes. So the question is, how could we test this kind of idea experimentally? That's right. And in the interesting thing is that for different mass regions of whatever this particle is and different interactions, you have to you have to have a slightly different set of experiments. So basically, a each one of your experiments is going to be sensitive to some part of the parameter space that um, of your dark matter. Um, the dark matter parameter space is huge. <laughs> Uh, it's somewhere between 40 and 72 orders of magnitude. Uh, sorry, sorry. For, what, what do we mean by the parameter space of the dark matter? So, so basically, what is... So, Imagine that you have this, you're trying to discover this object, whatever it is, and you're assuming it's a some it's somewhere between a particle and a black hole. Hmm. And the, when I'm talking about parameter space, you want to understand the one of the bigger questions is what is its mass? Mm -hmm. What is the mass of this object? Because the mass is going to tell you about how much of it there is, because you already know the mass density, basically. And, um, and then when you figure out its mass, you have to understand how it interacts with everything else. Does it talk, what we call talk to the standard model, hmm. or does it interact with it? Uh, or is it just going through us and, and basically we're completely invisible to it? Uh, we know already that it has extremely weak interaction with the standard model, but is it weak or is it zero? Right. Both of these are a possibility. And we know it's weak just because we would have noticed it already. Exactly. <laughs> By process of elimination, we would yeah. have seen it already. Yep. Let me pause for a second to talk about The Great Courses Plus, a streaming service that gives you access to a large variety of courses taught by some of the best professors out there, from serious stuff, from history, science, literature, to learning new hobbies. You can learn to play guitar or perform magic tricks. 
One of the great things about the Great Courses Plus is you can watch from your mobile device or on your TV at home. You can sit around with the family, with your kids, and learn new things. I myself have taught several courses with the Great Courses. Relevant to today's episode, I taught a course on dark matter and dark energy. So if you want the bigger picture of the stuff we're talking about today, check out that course and learn about the basics of modern cosmology. And now is the great time to start because the Great Courses Plus is giving Mindscape listeners a special offer free trial with unlimited access to the entire library. To get started, go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash mindscape. That's T-H-E greatcoursesplus dot com slash mindscape. Start your free trial today. So I, I guess, does it make sense to first, me- why, do we, why don't we mention some candidates for what the dark matter could be, just so uh, our listeners' minds have tuned to, well, how would we go look for these particular ideas? Uh, yes. So one of the uh, most common ideas has been what we call WIMPs <laughs> for weakly interacting massive particle. So WIMPs would end up being in the mass of what, 1 to 100 GeV. So that translates to somewhere between the mass of a proton to a mass of, I think, a gold atom, something like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and this is just one particle that is you know, the, the, that makes up all of the dark matter is just one very simple particle. And it has some small interaction with the Santa model. And it is in that one particular mass range. The reason that that mass range was particularly, you know, appealing from a theoretical point of view is that it would have, uh, it would have had some relation with, uh, with the weak force in the standard model. But uh, basically, that is kind of, the simplest idea really that you could come up with and ergo it's very popular because it's much easier to test so uh for example that would be one of these Uh, of course the primordial black holes that we discussed earlier is also one of the candidates uh you can also think of um of axions or axion like particles uh these particles basically can play a role in how um in how you know, the quarks uh, get mass and there there is a whole, basically they are motivated by theoretical theoretical needs. And then they happen to be naturally very good candidates for dark matter as well. So, uh, and this is very attractive from a physics point of view, because if you have a theory that kind of fixes a lot, like addresses many problems. Yeah, solves two problems at once. Cool. Exactly. So axions, so axions do, that. do that, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and they tend to be a lot lighter than the wimps that I was talking about. So um, axions, well, Q, the QCD axions, or like the the axions that people think about, are going to be ending up somewhere in the ten to the minus six electron volts, which is basically um, about. Let's see, <laughs> it, it's kind of I'm trying to figure it out. Okay, ten thousand times. Uh, lighter than a neutrino, <laughs> which I'm not sure is going to say anything. But uh, I think or... I think we can say yeah, ten to the minus six electron volts for an axion, whereas a proton is ten to the plus nine electron volts. So there's fifteen orders of magnitude in between. Exactly. So you can see already that the different theories of dark matter have a wild different masses. Actually, the lightest mass that you can actually think of that is possible to be uh, dark matter is is a regime that we call fuzzy dark matter. Uh, and it is basically the smallest mass is 10 to the minus 22 electron volts. <laughs> so something even smaller than that. Right. Uh, yeah, so there are a lot of beautiful theories. And then the question is, how can we find them? Do we take neutrinos seriously? Are there weird versions of neutrinos that could be the dark matter? Um, so there are... Uh, there are serious searches for uh, not our neutrino. Our three neutrinos are fine, <laughs> but if there is a sterile neutrino, a fourth neutrino, um, uh, it could have like a very high mass because then you would try to solve the problem of neutrino masses, which is a bit different. So, uh, in brief, the theory we have this theory of standard model that kind of tells us about the particles that we're made of and their interactions, and it is a very very successful theory. Um, and it kind of 
it's upsetting how <laughs> successful it is yeah. <laughs> from a theoretical physicist's point of view because we want it to fail so you can figure out what else is missing. And But one of the things that it doesn't address is neutrino masses. So trying to figure out how you can give neutrinos masses and maybe sort that out into, you know, the whole world of dark matter that is also a possibility. Okay, so so we have, besides the black holes, we have WIMPs, which someone just invented, right? They're not in the standard model. They're extra particles that, that would be fun to have. Yes. Axions, yep. which were also invented for another reason to solve other problems in the standard model. Neutrinos, mm -hmm. which we actually know about, but the ones that we know about can't be the dark matter because we know how heavy they are and they don't have the right masses. So you need to invent a different kind of neutrino. Right, exactly. And the thing with neutrinos is they're, they're a bit too hot, which means that they are going way too fast for their mass. And having them being that hot, like basically they're, from their mass and their interactions, it, they would, if they were all the dark matter, they would have destroyed a lot of the structure that we see. It's just because, you know, you can imagine that you have a clump of something and then the neutrinos are going so fast through it, they just break it apart. Yeah. Uh, so that would not make a good theory of dark matter because the world is definitely not broken apart. <laughs> well, this is, but this is also, you know, just a crucial thing to appreciate in terms of how the science of dark matter works, you know, because there are a tremendous number of constraints. It's not just like, oh, there's some dark stuff. It's mysterious. We don't know what it is. Maybe it's quantum mechanics or something like that. It's There's very, very specific properties this better have. And if you do something simple like make its mass too low so that it's too high temperature and fast, then everything breaks and it's not a good theory anymore. Uh, absolutely. Um, and and it's funny because, I mean, as a grad student, uh, a couple of my earlier projects were to kind of build a new theory of dark matter. And trust me, it's a lot harder than it sounds. <laughs> there are a lot of constraints and whatever theory you can come up with has to actually, you know, uh, has to not be ruled out by existing experiments, which actually rule out quite a lot. So, yes, and we don't know enough, that's true, uh, but uh, we know what it's not in a lot of different ways. And I think that is kind of, it's it's more of a detective work, which I think is really fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you try to kind of piece it up together because whatever dark matter is at the end of the day is going to satisfy all of these observables. And, you know, getting there is going to be absolutely amazing. The, and you also said something that I think is very provocative, so let's uh, circle back to it, uh, that you want the standard model of particle physics to fail. And this surprises me because on the internet, I read that, you know, establishment scientists are not open to new ideas and they just want to, you know, uh, prop up the ideas they already have. But you're telling me you want your theory to fail. That sounds weird. <laughs> um, yes. So we know that we know that the standard model that we have is incomplete. Uh, well, I as already mentioned, for example, it does not have a theory of neutrino masses. And we know that it is, it's what we call an effective field theory. So it, it addresses a, a, like a small, a small, um, up, like it is valid up to a certain energy, but not beyond. So for example, we know that it doesn't address, you know, quantum gravity in any way, but even simpler neutrino masses. So, the theory is incomplete. And then when it breaks, you would have a hint of what, what it is that you need to address and what it is that you need to fix. So uh, I don't think physicists are not open to new ideas. If anything, they come up with way too many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Very hard to keep track of. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I everybody wants it. I think when it fails, it's going to be the most exciting yeah. for us, the field, because that's when we know, oh, that's the hint. These are the things that go wrong. That's what we have missing in our theory, and that's what we need to address. To, um, and to be, to be perfectly honest, right, we were kind of hopeful that would happen at the Large Hadron Collider, and so far it is not. Absolutely. So now every time, you know, our experimentalist friends will show up new plots and and they're like, and the standard model's right again. And you yeah. can hear like, oh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an amazing theory and it's extremely successful. And it's incredible that it can actually make so many predictions of so many uh, observables and interactions that it can explain so beautifully. But we know for a fact it's definitely not complete. And 
it hasn't happened in a larger hadron collider but it will happen at some experiment at some energy scale at some point it will definitely fail and i think that would be quite an interesting hint for physics and what to do next yeah no it's a very strange situation to be in where your theory fits all the data and you're sure that it's wrong right <laughs> it's a little right, bit frustrating exactly. you don't have any clues to as to how to move on okay but speaking of moving on so we have some uh, evidence that dark matter exists. We have some candidates mm -hmm. for what it could be. And then I interrupted you, but you were going to tell us the different ways we can actually experimentally probe what the dark matter is. That's right. So uh, since we were just talking about the Large Hadron Collider, or what we call collider searches, that is one of the ways that we can detect uh, dark matter. And basically, you would just, you know, in the these colliders, what you do is actually collide you know, protons uh, together, and that kind of energy build or the, colliding them at very, very high energies is going to produce a lot of different particles. And at some point, you might produce a dark matter. So there are a lot of these searches that, you know, looking for the dark matter, then you might say, well, okay, how am I going to see this? Because it doesn't interact very much with my... Um, with the standard model particles, with the particles that I know. Uh, and the way that you would see it is actually would be kind of beautiful because you would see the what we call missing energy in your detector. So basically, we know about conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. So if you can, if you, what you get at the end of the day is like um, a stream of particles going one way and then nothing to balance it out on the other side, it means that you have something that is dark but it has to be there because of conservation of, of momentum. Of course, the, the the catch there is that neutrinos do that too. <laughs> so you have to eliminate <laughs> the neutrinos part. But other than that, that would be kind of an interesting way of looking for dark matter. I mean, it does, you, you can see why people on the street become a little dubious because you're saying that you're going to detect the existence of dark matter by looking for missing energy. You're looking for something that you can't see by not seeing something else somewhere else. That's right. Um, I think it's, it is interesting, but it also kind of balances out. It, it's kind of like, I think, okay, so if you were if you were walking by a park and then you see somebody sitting on a seesaw, but the seesaw, and, and then the other side is completely empty, but the seesaw is not really completely tipped, you're like, huh, something is sketchy <laughs> there. <laughs> right. Either the seesaw is broken or there is some something else that I just can't see sitting on the other side. This is kind of the same, a little bit of the same logic here, where there is either your interactions are broken and the theory is broken, or there is something else coming out on the other side that you just didn't see. And this is what you kind of trying to figure out what else is missing. And the idea of there being missing energy in events at a particle accelerator, that sounds like something which we might creep up on gradually, right? Like rather than discovering something and there's just a big plot and you see the particle that you found, this is something where just slugging through and collecting more data and doing this for years and years might be the way to get it. Is that is that uh, the right way to think about it? Um, that's true. So basically what you would make is try to kind of, a lot of these methods are based on statistics and large statistics. So what you would try to do is actually kind of put all of these events that look somewhat the same um, together and try to see if that missing energy has, you know, a common mass or, you know, common properties that keep creeping up. It's not just, you know, a failure of of your detector that is just like a missing a spot there. Yeah. So yes, a lot of it is built on statistics, especially because there are so many events in the Large Hadron Collider and they're going to increase even more in the next generation, uh, which is called LHC uh, High Luminosity uh, Large Hadron Collider. So, I mean, it is an amazing piece of experimental physics in general to be able to reconstruct all of that, especially so fast. Uh, but yes, you need statistics, and that's why a lot of these experiments, we run them for quite long, a long time to be able to disentangle the interesting events from what we call background, which is standard model, and it's right. also interesting in its own right, but it's different. Yeah. Okay, if we're not lucky enough to get evidence directly in an experiment like we build, like the Large Hadron Collider, what else can we do to look for the dark matter? Right. So then we can go into uh, what we call direct detection. So you want to detect it directly. How does this work? You have huge tanks of 
it's actually different material, but the most common one is really xenon. So you have a huge tank of xenon. It's actually a few tons of xenon that you put in a huge tank and then you put it very, very deep underground. So for example, there is one, um, so some experiments are usually like in deep in mine shafts and everything. Then you have, so then your xenon is just sitting there and you're waiting for one dark matter particle out of the many that might be going through your experiment. Uh, one of them to hopefully interact by basically, you know, when it interacts with that xenon and knocks it off just a little, that it would knock out one of its electrons. And you put the whole thing in, in an electric field and that electron is going to kind of get, <laughs> get um, uh, pulled to the top of the experiment. And that's what you know that, whoa, something, something hit there. Hmm. So there are a few things here. Uh, first, why do you need this to be deep underground? Well, because there are always backgrounds, there are always something else that might hit your experiment. And in this particular case, we call these cosmic rays or cosmic neons. Hmm. So there are a lot of particles that hit the atmosphere all the time. And they make a lot of other particles like pions and muons and everything. And these muons are actually like going through us all the time uh, because they're coming out of our atmosphere. And they usually don't do anything, even though I recently, well, I recently discovered that there is actually um, a whole set of research about cosmic muons flipping bits in computer clusters and that they need to <laughs> collect correct for that, which is absolutely amazing. I think, I think they also do uh, sometimes cause DNA mutations. Oh, they go. Oh, yeah. I think. That is really cool. I, I, I I, I'm not completely sure about this, but I mean, cosmic rays uh, do help your DNA mutate, so... Uh, there you go. The muons, they yeah. seem so muons. innocuous and yet, <laughs> but they do a lot of things. Yeah. So that, that is pretty cool. But yeah, so they could also, you know, hit your experiment and then you're like, oh, I discovered dark matter. Oh, never mind. This is atmospheric <laughs> muon. And that's why you put your experiment very, very deep underground where all that dirt and, you know, usually you put them sometimes under mountaintops and everything. All these mountains are going to absorb a lot of these uh, cosmic muons and uh, they would not interfere with your experiment. Right. Okay. And are, is this good for sort of all kinds of dark matter detection or are we looking for some kinds of dark matter but not others? So this would actually work mainly for WIPs, although there are new different uh, new techniques that, you know, instead of the xenon, they would choose different um Different materials like, uh, for example, helium and a lot of semiconductors and superconductor material. And that would well, that would help them kind of explore masses below the WIMPs. But the standard, you know, large experiment like this is going to be uh, mainly addressing the WIMPs, which is the 1 to 100 GeV uh, or giga electron volt mass range. Right. So, yeah. And my impression is, you know, these experiments have started. They've been going on, and they've looked. They we could have gotten lucky by now, right? We could have actually seen the wimps by now, but we're nowhere near finished looking for where they might be. That's right. So um, a lot of people are actually kind of getting stressed slash, <laughs> you know, thinking that maybe wimps are not the way to go because yes, uh, direct detection experiments have been going on for a while, and we've been building. Uh, bigger and better experiments and it's rolling out huge you know swaths of parameter space and the dark matter is not there yet um and, and interestingly enough actually soon we th these experiments are going to be so good <laughs> that they're going to be detecting they're hitting something that we call the neutrino floor and they're basically going to see neutrinos at instead of the dark matter. And this is incredible because these are very, very small cross sections uh, that you wouldn't see with with this type of setup actually yet. So yeah, if anything, we'll see neut solar neutrinos again so, in a different experiment. <laughs> so the neutrino, it's like neutrino static in your, in your radio. <laughs> That's right. It's like, just like, you know, that background that when you get, yeah, you, you get to it and then all of a sudden that's, it's going to dominate your background because direct detection experiments so far have been running pretty much background free. Yeah. Because nothing is going to get through, you know, a mile of Earth to get to your experiment and actually hit it. You have to be a bit careful about, you know, the material that you're using for the experiment because sometimes 
some material radiates a little bit. Uh, so these have to be very, very clean. And again, you know, my hat to experimentalists because they build amazing things. <laughs> but other than that, it's just, yeah, um, we haven't seen dark matter yet. And, you know, to be honest, because, you know, we, full full uh, disclosure here, that's the other big thing looming over us, right? We haven't seen any new particles at the Large Hadron Collider. We also haven't detected the WIMPs at uh, these underground experiments. And in some sense, they went hand in hand, right? I mean, physics arranges itself by what the masses of the particles are. And the sort of mass range the LHC is looking at is the same as the mass range that the WIMP detectors are looking at. And everyone expected to see something there, and we haven't. So it's a little bit of back to the drawing board time. Absolutely. I think it, it, it has filled kind of the field with a bit of disappointment and trying to figure out exactly how, where to go from there. Um, and what are the new strategies? I think it is kind of, I think it's a good thing to do um, in the sense that it's an, it's kind of more of a call for creativity and mm -hmm. a lot of people are kind of adopting that, like from both the theoretical and the experimental sides where you try to think of definitely new theories that could explain all of these observables because, you know, when you see nothing, that is an observable because that means it's ruling out something. Yeah. It's not just that it was waste. No, it's, it's really not. So whatever your your theory is has to actually explain all this these null results. So you really have to be very, very creative there. But also from an experimental point of view, you need to figure out new technologies and new experiments to probe different masses and th think of experiments that nobody else has built before and I don't know. I think all of this kind of makes physics really, really fun, <laughs> even though, of course, you would want something to work in the end and uh, you, you would want to discover new things, of course. But really looking at physics from a new way, I, I think is very exciting. But, you know, this is why I do what I do. <laughs> yeah, of course. But and also just just to be fair on the other side, you know, if the dark matter is axions, we don't have a hope of seeing them at these underground experiments. We have to use some completely different technique, right? That's right. And there have been quite a few of these experiments as well. So with axions, for example, what you would want to do is um, build um, halo scopes. So basically you're trying to, how do I put this? Um, you, you try to kind of have this experiment where um, an axion is going to, um, to kind of make some resonance. It, 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 these are Actually, okay, differently, it's said differently. These are very different scale experiments. So remember, we we're talking about like multiple tons of xenon. These are actually a lot smaller. And the axions are going, going to get into your experiment and actually um, uh, make a magnetic, electromagnetic field that you mm. would rather, that you would detect. Right. So something like that, yeah. Um, which is a completely different set of experiments and there's a different, completely different mechanism. And uh, they have been kind of doing quite a good job at ruling out different parameter space, of course, again, and different masses of possible axions, but th that space is very, very large. <laughs> yeah, no, my impression <laughs> is that unlike the WIMP case where we really have ruled out a noticeable fraction of the parameter space, in the axion case, there's still a lot of room to be explored. Absolutely, because these experiments are very difficult and yeah. you're kind of tracking very, very small uh, mass, basically mass windows, very, very thin ones at every time that you're running your experiment, unlike, you know, uh, these WIMP in direct detection where you can pull out a huge part of the parameter space all at once. Yeah. And so the last thing that you mentioned was indirect detection. So if you can't detect them indirect, if you can't detect them directly, why not try indirectly? <laughs> That's right. So indirect detection uh, has a funny name, but basically it means that dark matter is going to either uh, annihilate or decay into particles that we already know, uh, and then we see those particles. So said another way, you can imagine that the dark matter just annihilates at the center of the galaxy into, you know, electrons, positrons, neutrinos, gamma rays, all of the above. I, and then what you would see is from your gamma ray telescope, for example, is that there is an excess of gamma rays coming from the center of the galaxy that you just can't explain. You're like, wait, I expected a lot lower number 
of these gamma rays? Why am I seeing that many? That could be a dark matter. Of course, it also could be uh, astrophysics, as we've learned. Um, <laughs> wait, so... wait. I think that for the people on the street, you have to explain what that means. Of course, it could be astrophysics. Yes. This is all astrophysics. It is all astrophysics. That's true. Um, so when we, I think, yeah, I think this is physics slang for it could be <laughs> something that we already know, but not really. Right. <laughs> so, so okay. So basically, back in twenty, well, it started in two thousand nine, uh, where so there is this telescope. It's called Fermi Telescope, and it basically measures the gamma rays in the sky. And in two thousand nine was the first evidence that there was a little bit more gamma rays in the range of masses from like one to three GeV or so um, in the center of the galaxy. Then uh, with more data, and as we talked about earlier, you gather more statistics. Sorry, I'm sorry. I need, to, I need to interrupt here too, because I think we're doing another uh, physicist's shortcut because you said gamma rays in the range of masses around one GeV or whatever. But of course, oh. <laughs> gamma rays are photons and they're massless, but you're using E equals MC squared, right? That's right. Sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they have energies um, that you would get by annihilating a particle with a mass of that much. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, so in, yeah, in physics, I think the first day of grad school, they tell you E equals MC squared and C equals one. Yep. And then you just go from there <laughs> and you kind of never go back. Uh, but yes, the photons are indeed ma uh, massless, but these are kind of the equivalent energy that they would have, absolutely, right. based on that relation. Um, yeah, so, and then um, in 2014, we're gathering more and more statistics, it was even more evident that there is some excess there that ended up being called the galactic center excess. So why is the galactic center actually interesting at all? Well, you would expect within what our current theories of dark matter, you would expect that there is a much higher density of dark matter in the center of the galaxy. So you can think of it as like a deep potential well that your gas and stars are kind of like falling into. And so if you were, if the dark matter was to annihilate or decay or do something, it would be where there is the most of it, which is at the center of the galaxy. So this so far was consistent. Right. Um, then, yeah, so then there is this excess of gamma rays that we try to figure out. And we were like, okay, ooh, that would be interesting. Is that really dark matter? Um, the first thing that you would check, for example, is what is the spatial distribution of these stars, which means that, of these uh, gamma rays, which means is my signal coming from everywhere in the galactic center? Or is it, you know, correlated with the stars on the disk? Does it have like a shape of some sort? Hmm is you wouldn't expect the dark matter to have some weird shape. The first test it ended up that the signal was isotropic, which means that it's really uniform coming from the sky. So that's cool. Then you're like, oh, that might really be dark matter. That's interesting. But then you try to think of what else could it be, which is usually, and, and this is the toughest part with indirect detection, because you always have to say, what else could it be? Yeah. Then... The other competing theory, it could be that you have a lot of pulsars, uh, which are just these neutron stars that just turn really, really fast, and they're emitting a lot of these gamma rays that you don't see otherwise, that you wouldn't have seen detected previously. And then the question is, okay, is it pulsars? Is it dark matter? And you have to, you know, estimate how many pulsars you have, but it's in the center of the galaxy, which is, you know, pretty far. <laughs> so, and based on a lot of things that you don't know, so... Yeah, so I think that was the status of it right now is that it might be, it's probably mostly pulsars, uh. although it's not confirmed. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's kind of, yeah. So we need, to, we need to at least see some of these pulsars. So the way you would do it is by seeing it in radio telescopes, but you can't really see huge parts of the sky all at once in radio telescopes. So yeah. This is the fun of physics, trying to figure out its investigative work. Basically. I mean, it does it does make sense in retrospect, right? I mean, you are hoping to see signals of dark matter at the center of the galaxy because that's where you should have a high density of dark matter. But also there's a high density of other weird stuff at the center of the galaxy. And we're realizing we were not quite as careful as we could have been figuring out what the signals should be from that other weird stuff that is weird, but not nearly as weird as dark matter. That's exactly right. And so then you can go for, you know, 
Option B, okay, what if it, if the galaxy uh, the galactic center is too messy, where else can I see it? And then you might be able to say something about dwarf galaxies. So what are these? Um, you, we have so we have our galaxy, the Milky Way, and we are sitting pretty much at the edge of a disk of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. But the Milky Way is actually much larger, and it's we're swimming in what we call the dark matter halo. So it's basically a sphere of dark matter, more or less that you can think about. Anyway, so it has a lot of gravitational pull because it is a pretty big galaxy. And because of this gravitational pull, it also pulled smaller galaxies very close to it. And these are kind of like satellite galaxies. It's the same way that, you know, the the moon is a satellite of, uh, of uh, the Earth, more or less. Yep. Uh, we have that, we have this Milky Way has its own small satellites, its own, the, that we call dwarf galaxies, which are, Galaxies are a lot smaller. Anyways, okay. so these smaller galaxies have a lot less baryons or a lot less stars and gas than the center of the galaxy, which means that if you see signal from them, it's probably actually coming out of the dark matter. So they have more what we call the mass to light ratio. They have a lot of mass coming from dark matter and very little light coming from stars, unlike the Milky Way that has a pretty high mass to light ratio, uh, pretty low mass to light ratio. So we think that in dwarf galaxies, there's less chance we'd be confused by pulsars or other crazy things. That's exactly right. The problem is that they're much smaller, so they have a lot less dark matter, right? Yeah. So what we can do and what we do <laughs> is uh, we can stack them. So basically try to get for example, the gamma rays from a lot of these dwarf galaxies and put them together on top of each other, stack them, and try to see, is there something significant there? Do we really see an excess of dark matter? Um, and then, so the status of things is that there was one dwarf galaxy that might have had an excess, but <laughs> there is nothing confirmed. And a lot of my current work is trying to better understand how much Dark matter should we expect in these galaxies? Because it's a very difficult measurement that we have to do. So, mm. yeah, there is a lot to be done in physics, basically. <laughs> so, okay, but I mean, this is this is good for the people listening. I mean, you have some data. Uh, so is the, is the constraint that you don't have enough data of gamma rays from these uh, dwarf galaxies yet, or that we haven't analyzed them carefully enough, or that we don't understand the background astrophysics? So uh, we have a lot of data here is just that uh, so it, it's not about the background of astrophysics because you'd expect that to be small it's okay. basically how much dark matter do you expect in dwarf galaxies altogether mm. and that's a very tough kind of measurement to, or m measurement between quotes that you have to make the same way how much dark matter there is at the center of the galaxy is still a big question um we have so Let's focus on dwarf galaxies because they're a bit simpler. Mm -hmm. How would you know how much dark matter there is in a galaxy like that? Well, the only measurement that we have is really based on the motion of stars. So, uh, and this is not 3D motion, so I don't really see all the directions of motion of these stars. All I see is uh, what we call the line of sight velocity. But basically, is the it's basically a Doppler shift. Is that star going away from me or is it coming towards me yeah. and with what velocity. So I can make those measurements about few stars, usually just the bright ones, so not all of them, of these objects, and then have some understanding about, okay, these stars are go moving within a certain speed. Um, what is the amount of mass that would give me, that would be consistent with such a speed? So the thing is, there are a lot of things that could go wrong there. Um, basically, you don't know, since you're only seeing one direction of the motion of uh, stars, basically, is it coming towards me or away from me? You don't know the sideway motion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to tell. You have kind of like missing information. Like its sideway motion could be very large or very small, and you wouldn't know. So you don't really know like the full velocity of that. So it's hard to kind of get the full mass. Uh, you, of course, have to assume that the system is in equilibrium. Basically, that means that there is nothing weird happening <laughs> to your stars. They're not getting pulled or pushed by something else. In, uh, in particular, for example, the gravitational field of the Milky Way is not doing anything to them. Um, 
you have to assume that the whole thing is a sphere. It doesn't have to be. It kind of goes back to the joke of the um, spherical cow in a vacuum. Spherical cow <laughs> galaxy. Okay, good. Yes. That's right. So there are a lot of... So we know some uh, something about the mass of these objects, but we need to know them much, much better to be able to say to rule things out or rule things in uh, with much more confidence. And so what are the what are the prospects? What's going to happen? I mean, for, for one thing, you mentioned the Fermi uh, gamma ray telescope. Uh, uh, tell us about that. It's in space, right? This is it's hard to build a gamma ray telescope here on Earth, but it is possible. That's right. So the the this is a gamma ray uh, telescope that is in space. And the reason that it's much more difficult to have these things on Earth is because the atmosphere is really, really painful to get through. Uh, so for Earth-like experiments, you can actually do get some gamma rays, but at very, very high energies. And they are, you know, these what we call like um, Cherenkov telescopes. Um, so basically these telescopes in the desert, uh, I think... Um, some of them are in the desert uh, uh, in Africa, and basically what they have is um, a gamma ray that is very, very energetic comes in, and then of course it interacts and makes a shower of particles that goes through uh, the experiment, and uh, they end up moving in the medium of the experiment, usually water, faster than the speed of water, uh, right. speed of light in water. Nothing goes faster than the speed of light in vacuum, but in media, <laughs> it actually can happen. That's right. And that's how you would see these. Um, but yes, the prospect of... So Fermi has gathered a lot of amazing data. And actually, you know, it, it has given us, for example, catalogs, what we call like the, uh, the, uh, the gamma ray catalogs of a lot of things that are in the Milky Way and even a bit further that actually emit gamma rays. So it is definitely a great way to understand, you know, the astrophysics uh, of the Milky Way and other experiment and um, uh, the Milky Way and its surroundings. Uh, but the reason that I think the world of astrophysics or astroparticle physics is really, really interesting and in, in, in it for a ride is of all the experiments and all the telescopes that are going to come in online and have come in online. Mm. So there are, there is, the Vera Rubin uh, telescope, uh, or called LSST, is coming in 2023. Um, there are other upgrades of current experiments, but the one I'm most excited about, and a lot of my work is on, is called Gaia. And Gaia is this space telescope that was launched in December 2013, okay. with a goal of giving us the, the positional measurements, so the sideway motion and distances of one billion stars and this is one percent <laughs> of the milky way yes so this is That's so awful. wait so yeah i mean since you're younger than me uh you forget <laughs> but when i was your age we were excited about the hipparchus satellite and this was a, a satellite that was going to get i guess thousands of stars their distances and their sideways motions that's right. So Hipparchus ran from 89 to 93. Um, and it was very exciting. But it's amazing when you see, you know, the the map of how much Gaia covers now compared <laughs> to Hipparchus. And uh, yeah, a lot of people get offended. They're like, Hipparchus was a great experiment. I'm like, I'm not saying anything else, but Gaia is amazing, too. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but just to see how amazing it is. I mean, it's really hard to know how far away stars are, right? You can see where they are in the sky, but it's this amazing technological achievement to also measure the distances to a billion stars. Absolutely. And their distances and their sideway motion, really, now you can... For the first time, you can actually have 3D maps of, to be, to be fair, now it's still just the closest stars, but from, uh, but it's absolutely incredible the way that, what, the amount of data that we're getting. So the second data release of Gaia was back in April 2018, almost two years ago from April 25th. Uh -huh. um, and we, and we got, so one billion stars, their you know their distances and their sideway motion that we call proper motion, but a subset of them we also had the line of sight velocity that I talked about earlier. So, so for a subset, a very small subset of seven million stars, we actually have six D kinematics. It's mm. absolutely incredible, and the it's uh, it's an amazing kind of it's an amazing data set that you can get so much out of. And indeed, we did. Uh, Back in 2018, uh, a new merger of stars has been discovered uh, based on the motion of stars. So 
Um, let me explain what mergers are. Basically, yeah. remember earlier I said that we have these satellites because the gravity that, you know, the Milky Way is kind of pulling a lot of these small satellites into it. Uh-huh. Well, these satellites, they have, you know, stars and dark matter, but sometimes they crash into us and we pull them quite fast. So they would just completely get completely disrupted. So they're completely destroyed and get mixed up with the Milky Way. So the discovery of 2018 is that there is such a merger that has happened somewhere between six and 10 billion years ago and smashed into our galaxy, brought in so many stars with it. Um, and, and it's interesting because it's a, it's a pretty big object. Its mass was somewhere between one and 10% the mass of the Milky Way. Mm. And we never knew it was there until we actually finally had the kinematic data for it. Um, it has a very unfortunate name <laughs> because of the person who first saw it called it the Gaia sausage. Um, <laughs> because it is get, roughly sausage shaped uh, after being. Because it is, yeah, it is extended. Yes, uh, um, <laughs> but we still give that person hell every time. Okay, the Gaia sausage. Them. Yeah, I mean Gaia just seems like you know Greek mythology, very highbrow, and then was like making the sausage. Okay. That's right. So Vasily Belukarov is a person you should blame. Uh, he, he's an incredible physicist. And he saw it and he saw the shape, you know, it was a bit sausagey. So he went that with that name. Uh, after the fact, there was um, um, there were attempts at calling it the Gaia Enceladus. Um, and the Enceladus is a Greek god, son of Gaia, yeah. which is amazing. It, it, but it's unfortunate that everybody will remember only the sausage. So, yep. you know, it sticks. So I yeah. think maybe yeah. <laughs> that was... So there was something good there. Um, so, so what so, could we learn about dark matter from seeing this sausage-shaped collection of stars that has been cannibalized by the Milky Way? That's right. So that's where uh, what I do comes in. <laughs> so a lot of the things that I've been doing is trying to understand how much dark matter would come from these mergers and answer the question, can I understand how fast the dark matter is going based on the speed of these stars when they merge in. Hmm. So what I do is actually use uh, simulations. Uh, a lot of them in part actually developed here at Caltech uh, from uh, Phil Hopkins group. It, these simulations are called FIRE, which actually is an acronym for Feedback in a Realistic Environment. But the reason that it's really cool is because we can make a lot of fire puns for <laughs> the titles of our paper. Uh, <laughs> Physicists but, are just the worst. There's no pun they cannot possibly resist. I know. We just really can't help no. it. <laughs> <laughs> but so, uh, so yeah, what I did is actually I used a lot of these simulations. So these simulations actually simulate what building a galaxy just like the Milky Way. It's really, really cool. So what you do is like you start the really, really early times. You have your dark matter particles and you teach them gravity. And then you also add in and beauty of uh, the fire group is actually uh, of you know, the physics that has been brought in by the fire group is to um, add uh, add a lot of these physics of, you know, the gas interactions and the stars, et cetera, on top of that. And then you let that, you just like teach it different interactions and you just let that evolve from very early on. And at the end of the day, 13 billion years later, you end up with a galaxy that looks very much like the Milky Way. It's not exactly the same, mm. obviously, but it is. it has the same properties in the sense that you end up with a nice disk galaxy, it has a proper mass, et cetera. And this is absolutely incredible. The cool thing about these simulations and the reason that I really love using them is that I know that the, I can track the stars and I can track the dark matter, basically particle by particle, to figure out exactly what's going to land in you know the sun or the uh, the position of where my where the sun is, would be in these simulations. And then figure out if there are correlations between, if there are any relationship between the dark matter and the stars, uh, and where they came from, etc. And what would I expect to see in my experiments today? And when you when you say, <laughs> just to be clear, when you say you can track every particle, this is not like elementary particle like proton. This is the particle in the simulation that is used to model a whole bunch of mass. That's right. So. Unfortunately, we cannot just like simulate the whole galaxy up to its, you know, <laughs> electrons. <laughs> That's we not don't really have realistic. Enough computers. Yes. <laughs> so what we do is that we we call these particles in our simulation, but these are actually like 
you know, huge clumps of, right. of dark matter and clumps of stars. So, for example, the stars and the the stars, what we call one star in the simulations, it really has 7,000 solar masses. So it's okay. basically about 7,000 stars clumped up together because that's where the resolution is going to be. Yeah, it's a, it's a low resolution version of the galaxy. I think that makes perfect sense that's in right. our modern uh, video gaming era. People know what that means. <laughs> exactly, yes. But the nice thing then is we can really appreciate the fact that since we do believe in dark matter, since it's not just modified gravity, the dark matter is located somewhere and the distribution is kind of lumpy and has structure and is interesting for better and for worse, right? Absolutely. And I think it, this is, I think it's really, really fun because, it, you know, it plays into, it is kind of the way that, the reason that I do this is because it plays into the experiments that we were discussing earlier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the lumpiness of dark matter means that you might have, you know, an excess of gamma rays coming from those lumpiness. Or if the dark matter is faster or slower, that would affect how many of them you would see in direct detection experiments, you know, in the tanks of xenon underground, because the faster the dark matter, the more energy it might deposit in the xenon. So it all is very much correlated at, lar at these very different scales, which I find absolutely fascinating because the theory of dark matter really at its essence is, you know, a theory of astrophysics and very large scales, but also particle physics and the smallest scales. Yeah. And everything has to make sense. And I don't know. <laughs> I, I can geek out about dark matter all day, but <laughs> I find this absolutely fascinating. So, I mean, what what have we learned? So but by knowing that there is this sausage there, there's other structures or whatever, um, what are the implications for trying to detect the dark matter and, and then finally finding it? That's right. So uh, basically what... Trying to um, trying to extrapolate the dark matter velocity, for example, based on the star, the velocity of the stars uh, from the guy sausage. One thing we found out that it might actually this the stars might be going uh, or the stars and and then consequently the dark matter might be going a bit slower than we would expect, which means that we might have been ruling out more parameter space and saying that oh this dark matter cannot be this more than we should have. So we kind of have to kind of go back and really um, address all of these you know, all of these differences and making sure that our initial models that are not really empirical, <clears throat> they're just based on assuming that the dark that the Milky Way is relaxed and everything is fine. <laughs> yeah. uh, we realize that no, the Milky Way has quite more interesting structure than we thought before. And we need to take that into account in our experiments. Um, one thing that is quite interesting that uh, I found last year with uh, my amazing collaborator, Brian Ostick, who is a postdoc at Harvard, basically he was trying to, uh, so he was building this machine learning methods, um, trying to figure out which stars did not come from the Milky Way. And this is absolutely amazing. So then he built this wonderful catalog and then he sent it to me <laughs> and he was like, uh, I don't know what I'm looking at. Uh, this is the star catalog star, like the star, um, the stars just have fun. I was like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> this is going to be great. So then uh, the first thing that you do really uh, when you get a catalog or any data set is that you start plotting it and you just make random plots and figure out does it look like expected to? Does it not? I'll take your word for course, it. <laughs> yes, uh, I might be a little bit less theory <laughs> than you. So I do use data. Um, anyway, so I started plotting these, and the, you know, the Gaia sausage was there, just there, without me having to look for it. And I was like, "This is amazing!" But then there was like this clutter clump of stars that was not supposed to be there, and you know, when 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 you're young and you're watching movies and everything, you just think that oh yeah, if I see something amazing, I'm gonna have my eureka moment. I'm like oh this is incredible, uh, but then you go to grad school and you realize that every moment like that is just a bug in your yeah, code. No, so many <laughs> eureka like, moments that didn't quite uh, see the light of day. It's nope. true. Exactly. Uh, so of course, uh, as a well trained failed grad student, <laughs> that was the first thing that kind of came to mind. So I sat on it for three weeks and didn't tell any of my collaborators. Uh, I was plotting it every which way. But then I realized, no, it's actually, it might not be a bug. It actually might be something, which is really cool. 
And then you have to actually check against the literature and you're like, oh, it might be something that somebody else has already found, in which case that's pointless. Sure. Um, thankfully, nobody else has found that one. So I got to name it, <laughs> which is really cool. That's the best. So, this is cool. It's called Nyx, N-Y-X, for Greek goddess of the night. That I thought was particularly fitting here. Um, but what can we learn from this? So Nyx is that this it's a clump of stars that are rotating with the sun. Like it's These are stars that are very close. They're co-rotating, but they also kind of have this wave of movement towards the, the center of the galaxy, which is very bizarre because you don't expect them to do that. So <clears throat> then there are these two uh, these two theories that we could think of that would explain this. Either something hit the Milky Way and kind of caused these waves and these stars are kind of getting pushed just because, you know, imagine you, you just, if you have a lake and you're throwing a rock in it and then it's going to cause waves, uh -huh. and the stars are just moving that way. Or it's, an, an, it's a merger, just like the sausage. So it's another object that just fell into the Milky Way and these stars that I see here are actually remnant of this merger. The interesting thing is that if it is indeed a merger, it might have also brought in with it a lot of dark matter mm. that would have formed something called the dark disk. So something that is kind of co-rotating with us. And that would change, you know, our estimates of direct detection and detection um, quite a lot, actually. So we're still trying to figure out what it is. But if any, it, but it's definitely really fun. So. So uh, j this is something that I get confused about, so maybe help the audience with. I in some sense, we hope that there is less dark matter near us than we think, because we, we have a certain threshold that we've ruled out, right, of a number of events in our detectors, etc. And if there's more dark matter than we think, that means that the parameter space is even lower, Right, the parameter space is even is even more constrained by our experiment. So there's more mm -hmm. wiggle room if there's less dark matter around. Is that the way it goes? Did I get it right? Um, that's right. So um, so if if dark matter is a lot less, then a lot of more of our theories are still possible. Yeah. However, if the dark matter, for example, if the dark matter coming is coming out of a dark disk, so if it has a, a non-trivial velocity distribution, then the shape of of those limits that we see in the literature is actually quite different because this, you know, this new structure is going to affect uh, very high masses, but it's not going to affect low mass dark matter. So, you know, usually like these plots that we are ruling out might actually look quite different. Hmm. Uh, so it's not just, it's not just like an overall scaling. It's not just, oh, you, more of it or less of it is going to be ruled out. It's just that the shape so the mass versus the probability that would detect it might look quite different, which would be very interesting. Right. Okay. So Gaia, be, because it's given us this 3D map of a billion stars, is helping us figure out this interplay between the location of dark matter in the galaxy and our ability to constrain its properties here on Earth. That's right. So the three, it only has a billion stars, uh, basically with proper motion. So the, the sideway motion right. and the parallax. It's only a subset of 7 million of them that has 3D velocities. But for the third data release of Gaia, which is scheduled for next year with some delays now, but uh, we're going to go from that 7 million up to 100 to 150 million. So uh. it's going to be amazing, whatever we're going to get. Like, <laughs> I'm very excited for that. Um, so, yeah, so we can do that. We can also do... Um, so it's not the only thing that we can get out of Gaia. Um, there are what we call, in the process of pulling these satellites, they end up forming streams in the sky. So basically stars that are kind of almost aligned. And using Gaia, for example, we can actually see gaps in these streams. Um, and there is one of these streams I called, uh, it's called GD1, that has a couple of gaps. And then the question is, how do you explain gaps in these streams yeah uh and one of these theories is that if you have a clump of dark matter that just goes right through your stream and pulls a lot of stars with it then that means that um that's how you would get one of these gaps in your stream uh which we can see with gaia and the question is how big is that clump 
uh, what is it, how fast it was going, etc., really helps you narrow down the theory of dark matter that mm. you have. Because some theories of dark matter, for example, would not have very low mass clumps. And if you see a very low mass clump, it means that that theory is not right. Is that so? Sorry, what kind of theories of dark matter would not have low mass clumps? So something that we call warm dark matter mm -hmm. um, and even theories of self-interacting dark matter. But let's focus on the warm, warm dark matter. So um, remember earlier when I said that neutrinos are going too fast, so they destroy uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the structure that they have. So instead of having something as hot as neutrinos, if you have your dark matter that is a bit warm, which means that it's going a little bit too fast, but not extremely fast, yeah. then it will destroy very small, uh, like very, very small galaxies or satellite galaxies just by going through them and puncturing them and basically heating up the system is what we call it in astrophysics. But, um, but it's not going to make much of a difference to larger objects. So which means that these theories are not going to allow small enough clumps. That's right. in, Got it. You know, what we call, yeah, cutting the power spectrum. So yeah, so then the question is, the gaps that you see, are they consistent with very, very small clumps? And if so, that would rule out models of warm dark matter, for example. Got it. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. So there's there's clearly this very exciting frontier set of prospects about, you know, the, the new data coming in and teaching us about dark matter even before we can uh, directly detect it. But therefore, I feel like, you know, we've done our duty and we can let our hair down a little bit now. You already mentioned the idea of self-interacting dark matter. I mean, all of this dark matter stuff that you've been talking about, all the ideas for it, uh, have roughly speaking been the the dark matter is just there. It, you know, it might be in different places, it might be different densities, it might be different velocities, but it doesn't do anything other than move under the force of gravity. But now you're you're introducing the possibility that the dark matter could be more interesting. It could interact with itself or or dark energy or something or ordinary matter in interesting ways. That's right. It could uh, it could have its own self interactions along with any interaction that it might have for um, with the standard model with our particles. So one thing that you know is a particle physicist nightmare is that what if dark matter does not interact with us at all? Right? Yeah. How can we possibly see it? Well, if it has its own self interaction, which means that yes, it interacts with gravity that's a given with dark matter but what if it interacts with each other like two dark matter particles you know they uh, bounce off each other they scatter off each other annihilate into you know more dark matter etc what would we see well interestingly if that happens it means that the um the higher density points so the center of dwarf galaxies or the center of the milky way is going to be a lot less dense and the reason for it is because if there is a high density spot and they're interacting too much, they will kind of kick each other out and that would drop the density of that of that part. This is what we call the core versus cusp. So from simulations, you would expect to have a cusp in the density of dark matter, which means that the profile, so which means that the profile is like very, very steep, that there is a lot of dark matter in the middle of galaxies and in particular dwarf galaxies. Uh, but if you add in self-interaction, that cusp becomes a core, which means that instead of just sharp, going sharply very, very high uh, as you go to smaller, smaller distances from the center, it's going to just like become, you know, more or less a constant or stable. Okay. Um, so a little smushed so, out, a little bit more fluffy. Exactly. And it's a bit smushed out. So, so that would be kind of a probe of seeing that dark matter is indeed there and it has some kind of properties, even though it doesn't interact with, you know, the electrons and the protons, et cetera. So you would see it from what we call from astrophysics or astrophysical probes. Do we have some, you know, pre-existing feeling for whether or not we should expect the dark matter to have inter interesting interactions with itself? Or is it just easier? I know this is sort of a only quasi scientific question, right? It's like our feelings rather than what we can observe. But, you know, we do have Bayesian priors on what we expect. Do you think the dark matter interacts with itself in interesting ways? Um, I think so. I think our, pri well, I think it's very unlikely. This is just 
you know, it's not ruled out, but it's, it's very unlikely that dark matter is just that one particle that has like that one interaction <laughs> with okay. the standard model that's way too simple, especially given how complex our standard model is. I would expect that the dark matter sector, and it's a whole sector, it's not just one particle, for example, is going to be complex, it's going to have very interesting interactions, etc. So, yeah, I mean, I think I would not be surprised if the dark matter has you know, some kind of self-interaction. And if it's a very rich sector in general, um, then what we have, I would be very surprised if it was just one. <laughs> if it's very simple. Yeah, I, I mean, that would, I yeah. ask in part because I honestly don't know myself. You know, I, I, I've written papers about interesting uh, ideas for dark matter, including one on dark electromagnetism, where mm -hmm. you can have dark magnetic fields and maybe even dark atoms and dark chemistry and things like that. But I, I just don't know if it's more likely that it should be that way, because there's a million different ways you could have interesting dark matter sectors, or less likely because it's just an ugly complication that doesn't actually solve any puzzles. Um, yeah, I think it's a very interesting question and and i think it's one of those things that it's it's good if people think differently because they will yeah <laughs> spend time doing different things <laughs> but yeah um they i mean rationally there is no a priori information right about this at all right so it's something that we need to to kind of track i i think i would be very surprised if it's very simple but that's just me <laughs> <laughs> well no like you said it's good that different people have different intuitions about this because ultimately we're going to find out by you know doing the experiment and we're going to figure it out and i think that you've given us today a lot more reason to be optimistic that we will uh figure it out i think don't you know correct me if i'm wrong but uh your enthusiasm is contagious i think that i'm, I'm excited <laughs> about the uh prospect for learning more and more about dark matter in the near future I tend to be very optimistic about this. Uh, well, and I also love my job. <laughs> so it is one of those things. But yeah, I, I know people who are a little bit less optimistic. So this is the most optimistic of you guys. <laughs> Good. No, I, I asked the right person to be on the podcast. Uh, Lena Nassib, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you.